So, uh, do you hear me? Right. So, uh, first of all, I want to thank you all of you because it's a splendid day. And if I was on the other side, probably now I was drinking wine in Piazza del Capo. So, really, really thank you. <laughs> and the second thanks go to the goes to the organizer. Uh, it's actually, when they you know they invite me for the, I was a bit confused. Then I realized, oh, it's the first of April. So probably it's a joke. So I realized it took me a while to realize. But however, here I am, and uh, today I would like to discuss with you um, 3D models. I I'm not going to talk about technical 3D models, okay? But 3D models more as a as a, the intellectual uh, value of them. And uh, then I will do that in the context of the excavation. Hmm? And uh, I would like to present. I'm going to present some case studies where we are experimenting uh, in Lund. Um, actually combining technology and I would like to, to present and to discuss with you the result we achieved so far. So the first thing is that um, actually if, if I tell you 3D model probably you're going to think immediately to 3D reconstruction or you know 3D models online and so on. However um, it's important to point out the fact that uh, 3D models are used in archaeology. I mean in the cultural heritage sector to communicate from at least actually the 19th century, where a real model, hmm, like a cork model or wooden model, were realized actually to, to do pretty much what we have been done so far in the last 15 years, to generate what, let's say, reconstruction, if we can use this, this name, or actually also to, uh, uh, to, to, to represent the state of the art of monuments. For example, this is the plastic of, of Italo Gismondi, that is in Rome at the uh, Museum uh, Museo della, della Civiltà Romana. I don't know how to translate it but properly. This is actually this is what the, the, the Constantine moment. So, and in that, that museum, if you are going in Rome, I really recommend to go. It's interesting because you cannot see just reconstruction or simulation, but you also see simulation of battles, of events. So it's interesting because in the 19th century, the use of these models were extremely, extremely popular and were very important because allow first archaeologists or architects to put together the information, really geometrically, but also to let the people understand what it was about. Um, oops. Yeah, another interesting example um, of this technology of work, beautiful work, is the work of Felice Padiglioni. This is actually the, plus, the, 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 the model, cork model uh, and gyps model of the city of Pompeii. Um, this model is very different from the previous one because this actually show the state of the heart of Pompeii at the moment where this, this actually work was realized. I've been working recently um, uh, in Pompeii together with, uh, with Michael Leakes from Lund and with the Visual Computing Lab from Pisa. We have been uh, actually uh, also went through uh, the reconstruction of some of this part scanning. And I can tell you today, working in the Insula of I-1, where there is the house of Kegiri Yugundus or the house of Torello di Bronzo, is actually impossible to see details that instead were recorded at that time. So we are completely lost today information. So you see, this way of using models in the past was more or less, in a sense, the same way of we realized 3D model for documentation. We're not actually the purpose documenting as we do today, but they function very well. And most important, they were done actually by people who were, you know, uh, uh, connect to the archaeology and to cultural heritage. So, but what do we do today? As I say, I mean, to do today in virtual reality using computer graphics, we more or less realize similar things, at least so far. I mean, the, ma the, the majority of, of, uh, of using computer graphics in cultural heritage and, of course, archaeology was, for example, for reconstruction, more or less was the same. Obviously, the process is different, now it's faster, you can involve more people, but the concept was not so far. As well as, of course, this is the same insula you have seen before. High resolution scanning of the entire insula, and you see, again, mapping with images, so you have the high resolution detail. But you see, at the end, is the state of the heart of what we can actually see today and use it. So there was not much different. Um, so just to say that 3D model is, it's, you know, it's something that we, we have been using a lot. Um, today, however, technology allows us also to combine these two things together. For example, we can use uh, 3D model coming from a laser scanning acquisition 
as a geometrical uh, reference to build up our reconstruction in order to have a stronger control. So we can really enhance this experience and generate more and more uh, interpretation uh, or, you know, what you say, simulation or reconstruction. But actually, the rules change quite quickly in the very same moment we start using or we start trying to use 3D models for archaeological investigation for several reasons. Well, of course, the possibility of having 3D information in the field has definitely exponentially changed or increased our experience or the possibility or the need to, exp uh, to experiment with new visualization platform because, you know, we have a lot of data. Uh, but obviously, you, you know, for the whole of you as an experience in the field, well, you, we have a very actually limited time frame. So if you want to produce and realize, use the 3D model in support of our understanding of the site, well, we need to have them on site, sometime the very same moment when we excavate it. And this is actually make everything complicated. In fact, before, this was absolutely out of any possibility, at least for most, you know, of archaeologists. But uh, recently, actually, introduction of, of development of technology, low cost, of instruments, also laser scanners are now much more affordable, image-based 3D modeling, you have seen probably photo scanning this, during these days a lot, allow us actually to experience and experiment with this data. And of course, definitely try uh, the integration of, of, of information at a different level. However, using a GPS, for example, I thought I'd say, well, I would say a GPS, an RTK GPS, we can generate a map, a map of a town. In, this actually was done in a couple of hours. It's a very large town in, in, in uh, north of, uh, of, uh, of Lazio, in Italy. But you cannot just generate a map. You can also, in the same moment, using technology, having high-resolution acquisition of, for example, the area where there is the ongoing excavation. And using different technology, again, you can even have more accurate information about, for example, burials with the disposition of the skeletons, or Graffiti, well, it's probably better seen there. These are all 3D models, but they're not the same. They come from a different history. They come from different typology of instruments. Our interpretation also, in the very same moment, we optimize them, we change them. And of course, we are not really used to with this data. Um, so what actually I think, or we think, in, in, in our discussion group was needed was a platform where we could actually put all this information together and look at that in the very same moment we were in the excavation or immediately after, because we wanted to see if this actually was uh, really helpful for our investigation. Another distinction that I really would like to point out before starting with the case study is the difference between the 3D models and the graphic documentation. Both are definitely interpretation. No? However, what are the differences? Well, this is a bidimensional image, but, you know, our 3D models. Well, in the graphic documentation, what you can see is the deliberate choice of the archaeologist standing, stepping inside the archaeological excavation, recognizing a context, hmm, and then drawing it. So it's important. There is a direct connection with the field. There is actually, usually, the uh, identification of context, stratigraphy, you know, of what? Of an interpretation of what has been actually excavated. On the other side, these models, or well, these drawings, doesn't allow actually to show anything else. So if something is missing, it's lost. Or, most important, what you see here is not really the context. It's just the border of it. What is inside, there isn't, right? So you see, there is, it's very important, crucial because this show what actually an archaeologist decide to keep before destroying it. This is crucial, but doesn't display anything else. On the other side is that, actually, you can see, well, there, much better, you can definitely see the typology of information that we, as a human being, use to recognize the context, like the color, for example, or the, if, if actually there is water or humidity, the changing of, of, of um, uh, of, uh, of um, um, material inside, and definitely this definitely allow to keep you know a visual or a, or a better understanding of the relation between the, the artifacts, like in that case, and all the rest. So what I'm trying to say is that first, you cannot use 
a 3D model. You cannot think of using 3D model to substitute uh, actually graphic documentation. Not at all. It would be a mistake. Hmm? What instead we need to do is combining those. Those are complementary information. Those are the, the two sides of the same coin. So the challenge for us has been we want to have this together. We want to see if I can actually record something before its destruction and actually including in that something for I as archaeologist, as a person who excavated that and also taking the responsibility, destroyed it immediately after, actually detected that. So um, how did we do that? Actually, this started in 2009 um, in, on the archaeological site of Uppo, Uppokra. Is correct? Uppo, yes. Obviously, after five years, you know, still training my Swedish. However, um, why this site? Complex stratigraphy uh, is uh, Uppokra, first of all, is a central place located in south, in very, the very south of Sweden. It's an Iron Age um, site, very important. And uh, we choose that because the complex stratigraphy different typology of structure, so we wanted something challenging. Uh, the sites of the excavation, and of course, because it was very close to the department, so. But, um, and also, of course, the continuity of it, of the excavation. So, the, the, the excavation is done, um, is, is, is uh, under the responsibility of the Department of Archaeology and Ancient History in Lund, and of course, we, we, um, uh, we, have, we, we can actually be sure that during the years we can keep making experiments there. So the first time, we used ARC3D. ARC3D was an image-based model, a computer vision-based technology uh, was, at that time was online to actually try to see if we could monitor, if we could actually have, you know, during the time frame of the excavation, 3D models. It was a very interesting experiment because we, at that time we were not joining the excavation, first mistake, because actually it's the person who excavate who should make the documentation. Because actually it's the person who established a relation with the site that should do it. However, it was an experiment. And what was very interesting is that, geometrically speaking, it was great. We had a very good matching with the rest. But then we could only use, actually, bidimensional image. Now, for the whole of you who had the chance to read uh, Harris, hmm, it's clearly explained that the, the bidimensional documentation has been invented, has been done, to simulate a 3D context. You have stratigraphy and maps. So the idea is that we will have the chance to have, uh, have a three-dimensionality of what was. This is really stated. When you make your interpretation on site, you are doing it in 3D. So the best idea, clue, is because your brain works in 3D. So you look at the elements, you know, you touch it, and then you connect the elements, and then you report. It's not the other way around. So my question is, if I have a 3D model, why the hell should I use actually bidimensional documentation? So I don't understand that. And this is not easy because for any of us, because we have been trained in using, in thinking in maps, in thinking in two dimensions. So not in maps, sorry, in two dimensions, because maps can be 3D and is another kind of interesting uh, uh, element there as well. So immediately I planned a new experiment. There was another, um, actually, um, ex uh, excavation in 2011, um, the, through a collaboration with the Ludwig Bonsman Institute, uh, which ran actually a geophysic investigation of the site, was actually detected an anomaly in a specific area in Upogra, and we start actually an excavation to investigate these anomalies. Um, and of course, what I did was joining the excavation and, you know, making a, a 3D model every time was necessary, and most important, the model was ready the same day, or, you know, was available for the team. And this is actually what happened. Um, I put all the 3D models in local coordinate, that time was not yet possible, in Meshler. And then I gave this system to the, to the team. In, that, in this case, it's the director of the excavation. Just let me be sure it's, it's off the audio. Yes, you know. No, in fact, we, we are, oh, perfect. Um, and it was interesting because he was, he was using it. And after using it, he was changing his way of acting on site. So the 3D model was, actually <coughs> changing his next step action, because he could review, because the 3D model in this case, this is not actually the sequence of the stratigraphy of the concept. This is the 3D models of the diachronic sequence of what archaeologists did on site. Uh, it's actually, we monitor 
our action. We are not going time traveling in the late Neolithic grade. This is important distinction. So what's happening is that it was, he told me I can go very far away and look everything connected. I can measure if I need, and I can go back and, you know, and continue my excavation. For me, this was a major achievement because I thought, well, I know now that 3D model can be used in this direction. Because, you know, one of my biggest question mark is a little bit like Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, is I'm constantly obsessed by, the, by the, the question of, are 3D models really useful? I mean, usually I make two questions, and I say, oh, do you think 3D models are, are, are important in archaeology? People say, oh, yeah, yes, why, yes. And then I say, why? Uh, this is important. We need to understand, are these actually really useful to detect, to detect new feature, to modify our way of doing? Otherwise, it's useless. We don't have really much time. You know, archaeology, we're not so, you know, we, we find a lot to get funding. So it's very important to, to be sure that our fundings are spent in the most efficient way. However, I was very happy with this, with this experiment. Uh, we had also uh, a very good collaboration in that specific occasion uh, with that case study with the, with the visual computing lab that supported us, especially because at that time, the software was very mature. There was no, no easy as today in, in actually getting everything uh, 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 prepared. Mm. But I was not really happy. I mean, I was satisfied. I was encouraged to proceed. But I thought, at the end of the day, we had, this is just a selection, at the end of the day, I had the sequence of my model on MeshLab, and then all the rest of the documentation into the GIS. And the rest of the documentation is crucial. It's very important. It's actually what we drove on site we recognize as a context, are all the database connected with that context? So I thought, if we don't put this together, it's not really so crucial, you know. Um, in the meantime, 2011, 2010, 11, actually, um, um, 3D GIS platforms start really dealing with, uh, sorry, sorry, start developing um, a new format file to handle uh, 3D surface text rate model, and actually now in very high resolution. So what we did was using Photoscan, georeferencing automatically the models once created, we found actually a pipeline to import those models in their correct geographical position inside our GIS. And we were very happy with that, because then I thought, well, now I can start thinking, I can start really planning something different. Another consideration is that, take into account that the current, um, uh, the current, uh, um, it's terrible when you lose the words, isn't it? However, the current uh, documentation method, field documentation method, has been developed in more or less 45 years. Hmm? 45 years. Has been the result of a large discussion that you can find actually in the literature. And in that 45 years, technology has never changed, never. So now instead, we are facing a moment where technology change, technology is crucial, eh? because actually, as, as, as you, you know, you know it's, it's affecting a lot of archaeological practice. Now, we don't excavate with hands, so we, we really use tools. So, uh, now technology change every year with opening potentials, and we cannot keep the discussion going on, because the, the, the cultural discussion the, the, is too slow. So, and there is not ma much experimentation. And you know, another terrible thing has always happened. People trying to squeeze the 3D model inside the traditional documentation. It's really not working. So it's a moment of, let, let's keep the revolution going, as, as actually it's said in here. Let's experiment. Let's make a lot of mistakes. So, but let's actually figure it out something new. I don't have this new here, just a bit. But, you know. However, <clears throat> In Upogra, we started a lot of uh, uh, acquisition, implementation. And another thing we discovered is that actually when you import a 3D model into the 3D GIS, hmm, that model turns into a container in a shapefile. So we can actually attach to it an attribute table. What does it mean that? It means that we can decide the semantic for it. We can decide how to query the system using the GIS to do what? To one day asking, for example, to the system, well, you know what? Show me all the archaeological feature that we thought belonged to the Iron Age. And actually, it creates a map, an artificial landscape of information that has been excavated in different models. So we as archaeologists, we've never seen them together. But they actually pop up in your map. And you can do what? 
you can actually draw it in 3D. It's another issue. We also draw as projection, but we draw bidimensionally because we try to actually simulate the 3D, no? Section, cross section, and maps. In this case, you can draw directly on the model, and the software snap hmm, the surface. So it's very interesting because what you get at the end is it something, first of all, you can have maps and section in the same space, something that for the overview who actually excavate, you know it's not easy. And that is actually an example. See, you can very easily just upload models that have been excavated in different moments, but simply querying the system. Now, a big issue here is actually building data structures that deal with 3D uh, structure <laughs> and that allow us hmm, in a long range time to query our system and to do what? And retrieve information in for all environments, simulation, where we can, you know, really think hmm, holistically you know, and look at the data and making our choice. So it's also something that has to be done, to be done before the excavation, not after. Um, yeah, after that, we, we start experimenting. And now all our exp uh, excavation are made with 3D GIS. Just something, 3D GIS is nothing new, it's not a novelty. There is plenty of beautiful literature where actually data are visualized in 3D. Arc scene is not new. But actually, uh, the implementation um, of boundary models or texturized 3D models coming from laser scanning or image based modeling, that is a novelty. That's open a lot of possibilities. So, in that case, for example, you see this is a Mesolithic site, it was very complicated, very extent, a lot of geological strata plus human strata. And you see, this is an artifact, for example, and I, we could actually measure the artifacts in 3D, and we could also measure the linear distance between the artifacts and the strata. And to do what? Well, to do the same operation without the trench, very far away, as if, as if you see there. And understanding it, actually, there is a connection between the strata, because we, we didn't have very, I like to work a lot with rescue archaeology, because that is where 90% even more, actually, of archaeology is going on. So if something worked there, something can work, right? So this was a five days excavation. You can also go, um, oops, uh, you know, like to see in sequence, you can turn on and turn off all the models according, because they are your reference. So when you import them, they are one into the other. So it's very, it's a very powerful system in this respect. And you can really keep monitoring or doing a lot of operation in the same time. But this is not the result, right? I mean, this is a system that is very helpful hmm, for us, really a lot. But again, you know, it's not probably we need a lot of time to get result. But we actually got something, so I will show you. Um, this is another interesting case study. It's a collaboration project between Lund University and Kalmar County Museum. And, and it's the archaeological site of Sandbibori. It's a, 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 a fort ring in Ireland, that is, a, is an island in Sweden, uh, where it's very interesting because we try uh, in 2012 and 13, if I remember correctly, uh, to go completely 3D GIS. And what happened here was very interesting because we, uh, I actually made the 3D GIS of the entire site. I don't, there were five or six trenches. You know? But then we focus a lot on human remains. This site is special because there have been uh, retrieved a lot of bodies, no burials. People have been killed, left there, you know. And so, but, I see, yeah, this is actually, oh, I forgot, sorry. Uh, this is the 3D GIS, yeah, we also made, so, well, so all the trench were moved there. So, the first year, what's happened is that a trench was opened, and the body was found. The body plus the head of another body coming out the trench. It was a rescue archaeology, so there was no time to open it up. It was not possible. So the material was removed and sent to the osteological lab in Lund, in that case. The, 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 the excavation was, was led by the, the, the museum, Talmar County Museum. And the year after, we opened a large trench, this one. So just to give you an idea, actually, the red one was the first trench where we found the first body and the other one was the second one. In both occasions, we made 3D models and we georeferenced them. And what's happened is that when we made the 3D GIS, they were matching perfectly, also when we cut the head, you know, it's perfectly, it was there, it was the context of two individuals that has been killed and, you know, they were in the house. So we reconstruct a cold case. 
all the material was sent to the osteology lab. And then what I did was I started working with osteologists, and she um, mapped in 3D, into the 3D GIS, all the fractures detected in lab directly on the 3D model. And we prepared a, a geodatabase where all the information were, were actually reported. The result of that is very interesting because we start actually querying the system and querying the system asking, show us all the post-mortem fractures. I mean, the fractures that came after the death. We had very linear pattern, 45 centimeters in both bodies, in, actually in the red lines. And that could be actually the, the roof falling down, cracking the bones. And we don't know nothing about the roof. We don't have it. So it's interesting because in the future, this information could really be used in support of to do, or doing what? Doing a reconstruction, a simulation, a, an archaeological interpretation. It was very important <laughs> for us because demonstrate, because actually the, the two of us we were on site excavating. And this was not possible to detect on site. In lab, it was not possible because the relation was lost. But actually we got it where? In a simulation environment. So it was actually a real result. Um, here's another quick, quickly I want to show you also this project. Um, in uh, 2011, um, we started uh, an acquisition campaign in Pompeii. This, we actually uh, merged a project, let's call it the Swedish Pompeii project, started in 2000 and is working in the Insula 5.1 in Pompeii. And in collaboration with the Visual Computing Lab in Pisa, we actually went there with a team, two teams, with two laser scanners, and it was very interesting because this is the insula, the stands of the insula, and every single dot is, a, is actually an, a station. Right? At the very beginning, we thought, well, we, we're probably going to do it, acquiring it, only one of the houses. There are four actually Pompeian houses inside. In eight days, actually, we had it all. So it's quite interesting. It was eight days of work, two teams. And of course, we, you know, everything was aligned and then was texturized and, you know, and obviously, uh, well, we developed several projects with that, but I will focus on the 3D GIS. And everything was merged. We started actually making tests using the 3D GIS as a platform to develop research, to investigate. So um, first of all, it was very interesting because we could put together a lot of information coming from the, from the house. And uh, most important, we start actually drawing directly the walls features on the 3D models and so, you know, you could very easily take off the, 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 the model and actually looking at what? At your interpretation of what you as archaeologists detected as an important feature and recorded it. Um, we also could, um, this was, was quite interesting, we also could import the documentation realized in 2005, 6 and 7 and so on. There were actually end drawings. But those end drawings display features that disappear because they've been excavated. So are crucial. It's important to have a system that is very easily allow you to, you know, import what actually has been done in a very qualitative way. So we, we start actually importing everything. And that was, was very important, was, was very successful, very interesting. Moreover, drawing 3D on, uh, on, the, on the surface allow us to shift our drawings on the other side of the wall. You know, if you are familiar with Pompeii, you cannot always go in the other room. You know, always. So, and this possibility allow, for example, to detect us uh, entrance that has been closed and then, you know, or covered with the frescoes, because we cannot take off the frescoes, fortunately. Then actually we can draw it on the other side and checking exactly where that entrance was. So it was very interesting, very powerful tool, simple. Then every single wall was connected with an external, with the database. So clicking on each wall, you add an Apple link with all the information concerning drawing previously arise, ortho images, high resolution images, diaries, and everything was, as you can see, connected with the Swedish Pompeii Project website, where the team from 2010 is daily updating all the information on site. This was a very good system because our GIS was extremely light and the team is spread out all over Sweden. They were implementing the, you know, the website, so the, G the GIS was just, you know, not uh, not re-destroy and re-recompose, I don't know what to say. So it was, it was very convenient. Uh, and yeah, you can query the system and get almost everything you need or everything is available. Um, this is another very interesting, uh, um, yeah. 
is a very another, another very interesting uh, um, tool that we developed. Well, we are working with uh, an architect, Danilo Campanaro, he's not here, but he's an architect uh, specializing in conservation. And what he did actually, he, he took our system, the 3D GIS system, made by archaeologists for archaeological purpose, to make an automatic risk map in 3D. So with this, actually, he customized the database in a way that you can retrieve information about which wall is actually bending most, hmm? because these are actually accurate information. You can have the different topology of material which compose the wall. You can have, you see, like a digital elevation model of everything. And most important, the system provides you also with tips, advice on how to treat that part, and high resolution images of the picture, plus allow you to retrieve statistics automatically on everything. So for, for me, it was, it was extremely astonishing the fact that this system really allow professionals from different sectors to work close. To, to, I mean, not, not just to work, to, to do something close. We presented this system to the superintendents uh, in December. And you know, it was really, they, you know, they got the attention of that because this could really allow to practice uh, a strongest uh, or a much complete monitoring of a, such a precious archaeological site as Pompeii. Um, oops. Another interesting experiment that we started, and in particular, let me just, in particular, this uh, research line was uh, developed by my colleague uh, Giacomo Landeschi. He has presented this system, you know, in detail. So <coughs> my apologies if they're just going very quickly, but. Uh, he actually made a visual scape analysis system. That's the name. He actually he plays in the GIS observation points, and then we implement the 3D reconstruction hmm, that was actually realized by Daniele Ferdani. It's, I think he's here around. I hope so. Or probably he's in Piazza del Campo. I hope so. However, and we start actually assessing visibility in 3D of what was visible from what. And what's interesting because we have hundreds of inscriptions inside the house. And using this system, we could actually understand which part of the house were used for what. And this is because one of the main research questions of the Swedish Pompeii project is studying the relation between public and private space. So you see, all these systems, all these things happen exactly in the same space. Um, yeah. My presentation is it's, it's over, but before, I really would like to thank very much the digital, uh, the Digital Archaeology Laboratoriate. This is our lab, the dark lab, and in particular, Stefan Lindgren, Giacomo Landeschi, Carolina Larson, and Danilo Marco Campanaro. I want to thank also ArcDIS. It's, uh, it's actually an archaeological information in the Digital Society project where we are developing all this in collaboration. It's very important. It's incredible support. And the student group, Guitarra. So thank you very, very much for your attention and, you know, I hope it was not too long. <laughs>